We are uh, really excited to continue this series of messages uh, that really is all about the power of the resurrection in our daily lives. And uh, we're going to jump in in John chapter 20 today. So if you have uh, your Bible, John chapter 20 is where we're going to be. I want to bring to you a message that I'm calling Right in the Middle. Right in the middle. Could you say that out loud? Right in the middle. John uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 19, is where we're going to pick up the story. We're looking at some different people who uh, were impacted by the resurrection as we realize that's our story. We are the people impacted by the resurrection. We began last week with Mary Magdalene. Did you guys enjoy learning about Mary? I mean, there was just something so great about her. Uh, John 20, we're going to see Jesus' closest friends impact uh, the impact the resurrection had on them. It says in John 19, John 20, verse 19. Man, I'm so confused. All right, John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day, that's the same day as the resurrection, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Verse 24, now Thomas, called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you want to speak to us in it. We thank you so much that what you're doing in us and what we are receiving from you in these moments gathered together. We always say we're one house, many rooms today. We are are one house in lots and lots of different rooms, in lots of various states of emotions and what's all happening out there. But I pray we would just hit pause for a second. I pray that we would have the perspective that comes from remembering that you are God immortal. You are outside of time. And you sit enthroned above the circumstances that cause there to be fear and trouble on this planet. And you are doing something far bigger. And you are far more powerful. And so I pray that in our hearts, there would not be a trace of anxiety because we would be choosing faith over doubt. And that we would remember that You are our good shepherd. And you said, do not fear, little flock. It is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So it is not for us to seek to control the circumstances. It's for us to realize that you are above the circumstances and that you want to give us peace and power so that we can then be your hands and feet in this broken world. And we pray this all, asking especially that if anyone has joined into the broadcast today on, on the internet or, or television or podcast and they don't know you as Savior, we pray that you would draw them to yourself through your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. We all said together, amen. We all said together, amen. amen. Wonderful. Well, the middle seat is... Uh, kind of the seat I have today. And uh, usually, it's not like the hot seat. It's not like the hot commodity. Uh, There are window seat people on airplanes, and there are aisle seat people on airplanes. Everybody participate in your uh, own environment here. Uh, Window seat people, show me me your hand. Uh, Airplane, that's what we're talking about. And then aisle seat people, show me your hand. Okay, see, I'm an aisle seat person because I need control. Uh, But I have often missed out because my beautiful wife, the only one on this platform that I can break and violate the six-foot rule with, uh, is uh, a window person. So I sort of get the benefit. I get the control of the aisle so I can come and go as I want. But you're a window person. And so as long as it's a two-by-two configuration, 
we get the benefit of both. Right. Right. If it's a three up, we don't do the weird. One, one time I got on a plane, and I, I got assigned uh, the middle seat. And I, I could tell the husband and wife beside me were husband and wife. And I was like, oh, do you want to trade? They go, no. <laughs> he likes smile. She likes me. I was like, this is weird. It's a four and a half hour flight. True story. I'm stuck between these two not so small people, if you catch my drift, who did not want to be around each other. Uh, but Jenny likes the window for the view, because that's just Jenny. Look at the colors go by. Me in the aisle, I need to control the circumstances. Uh, but she'll tell me if there's anything beautiful going on, because the, but, but no one loves the, the middle. No one's like, I, if I had like continued on, like window seat, aisle seat, who's a, who's a middle seat person? Like, yay, not having an armrest, that's mine, right? I mean, uh, the, the reality is the middle seat is, is the one that we all dread. And a car, being in that middle seat, it's like having to fish the seatbelt, out of fish the seatbelt, having people on, on both sides of you. We don't like the middle. Why? Because in the middle, to put a word on it, we feel stuck. When we're in the middle of something, we feel stuck. And that's true in a seat. That's also true in a situation. When you're in a project, when you're trying to do something, the, the, the beginning is exciting. And the ending is a celebration. Right. It's the middle where you get bogged down. I'm going to start this business. Oh, that's so fun. Here's how I'm going to do it. Throw the ideas on the whiteboard. There's, there's nothing too big in this stage. We're, this is the ideation. Our app's going to do this. Our, our product's going to do that. This is what the song's going to sound like. We throw anything at the board, right? We're just brainstorming here. We're just, we're just we're go nuts, right? Write some checks, right? There's no account yet. That's in the middle that we make up the bank account. That's in the middle that we make the LLC. That's in the middle that we get with the Secretary of State, in this case, Corey Stapleton, and make sure we can legally do it. That's in the middle. All that stuff happens. But here, it's just like, we're going to hire this. We're going to go there. In the middle is when everything gets difficult. Because in the middle, you're like, oh, man, all that, all that stuff that was on the whiteboard, someone's actually got to do it. Someone's actually got to execute. Who's actually going to be taking care of those details, right? In the middle. We, we, we feel like we're equally far from where we started out, but we're also just as far from the ending. Yeah. In the middle is when it's most tempting to give up. Let me show this to you in the, in the Bible, book of Nehemiah, probably the greatest instance of a project undertaken by a people. In 52 days, we're going to build this wall. We're going to go boldly where never, no one's ever gone before. Well, we're told in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, so we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together. Notice up to half its height at the halfway mark. OK, the whole wall's done halfway. <laughs> right? It's going to be a big wall to keep people out, but it's just halfway done. Notice the next verse I have on the screen, verse 10. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. What happened? They hit the slump in the middle where we've gone from, this is the best idea I've ever had, to this is hard, to this is terrible, to I'm terrible, to there's no way we're going to finish, right? And the, 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 the morale is just flagging in the middle, which is exactly what happens the last 50 times you tried to clean your garage. You had the best intentions. You pulled everything out of the driveway. We're doing this. But then at a certain point, you go, let's just shove it back in, right? Let's, no one will know. I won't tell if you won't tell. We won't have the Instagram post of how clean it looks. But that doesn't matter. Just shove it in. We don't need to park in the garage anyway. What, what, what do we have that garage for? It's for our stuff. It's not for our cars. It's for our stuff. And the storage unit is for the auxiliary holding ground for the stuff that can't fit in the garage. The driveway is for our cars, right? That's why I like in the South. They just don't even care. They just throw, throw their stuff about everywhere, just wherever. Any, anything's our, our garage. It's a massive garage. But it's in the middle this happens. It's in the middle that our fears can also overtake us. Right. One of the most scary things Jesus' disciples ever went through is, of course, the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Notice it says verse 14, verse 24. And this is when they gave up all hope. The boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. It was in the middle that they really began to lose heart. It was in the middle when they lost focus. It was in the middle when they thought they were going to die, when they thought they were going to drown. And that is exactly the emotion of what's happening in Jesus' followers here on the day that he showed up in the midst. They were in the middle of it. They were afraid. They felt stuck. They didn't think they were ever going to get out of this situation. And I love that the text says they were all in one room with the doors locked. 
I guess you could say the disciples had a lot in common with everybody watching this broadcast today. A lot of you feel stuck in the room you're in. A lot of you feel like in this room with the door shut, the walls are, 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 are creeping in on me. Right? I can only do homeschooling with my kids for two more minutes. Right? I try, but then it's really five hours of Disney Plus and then Netflix. Right? It's like, I, I tried to do homeschool. I printed out something, but then the printer said that we're out of toner. And so I, I couldn't figure it out. And, and now it's, you know, I just give up. Right? It's just, this is just not happening. It's just a melting down. That's how the disciples felt there. They, 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 say, they said that the, the doors were locked. The text says that. The Greek is more emphatic. It says that it's locked and barred. So they're, they're double locked, double barred. Why? Because they were afraid. They, they felt like they were going to be next. In a very real sense, they risked being arrested as Jesus' accomplices here in this moment. They were spooked. One commentator really describes the way they, they were kind of huddled together as, as almost like the, the, every sound you know, was, was foreboding. Every, every, they, could, they could just ex- expect at any moment the knock at the door. They could expect at any moment the, 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 the crowbar to, to take the hinges. And now they're going to be stormed in with the SWAT team to be arrested. I also think it's pretty epic that this is the disciples. And verse 10 says, it's minus Thomas. It's the disciples, which were how many disciples? Bible students, 12. Minus who now is dead? Judas is dead. And Thomas isn't there. That means that they're abiding by CDC regulation. There are 10 (laughs) or fewer here in this room until Jesus showed up. And here's how, how cool is this. When the 10 became 11, they all caught something. Come on, that's really good. When the 10 became 11, they all, so stay at home, stay in your room. When the 10 became, I'm just doing my part to help with awareness in this situation. It's in the Bible. When the 10 became 11, they all came down with something. But what they came down with in the moment was a spirit of calm. What they came down with in the, when Jesus came into the room, and that's OK. Your 10 can have Jesus in the midst of it, right? Your small group in your house, your family in your home. It can, when it has Jesus in the middle of it, there will be calm. And Jesus chose intentionally to show up when they were in the middle of this moment of fear, in, this, in, the, in the middle of this feeling stuck, when they felt quarantined, when they felt locked up, when they felt like they, they, they couldn't get out is when he chose to came. I like how the J.B. Phillips translation puts verse 19. It says, in the evening. So so that means it's also dark. When it's dark out, it's scary. When it's dark out, it's foreboding. So when it was dark, when when, when it says they were met together with the doors locked for fear, there was fear in their hearts, Jesus came and stood, notice, right in the middle of them, right in the middle of them. They're huddled up, and he appeared right in the middle of their circumstance and said, peace be with you. So comfort was the outcome of his inserting himself right in the middle. And I really believe this is a word from God for our country and for this world and for our church at this time and for you personally, that right in the middle of what you are facing, of what we are going through, is where Jesus wants to show up. He, like he did when the disciples were on the sea, is going to show up right in the middle of what you are facing. And when he shows up, you can expect to be calmed. You can expect to be calmed. He will always calm you. The Bible says that Jesus uh, showed up right in the middle. And and what was the, the outcome? The outcome was the disciples' five things were calmed, first of all, by his presence. I want you to, to see in this text that the, the, the presence of Jesus made all the difference. For how they went out was the exact opposite of how they came in. They came in afraid. They came in, you know, all hunched over. They came in, you know, with their, their hoodies on. And they went out triumphant. They went out bold. They went out comforted, right? It's like a child that comes into the parent's bed with a nightmare, f- crying and frantic and sweaty. But then eventually, the, the calming of that moment can cause the child to go out differently and hopefully rapidly. <laughs> Get out of here, right? Calm. The disciples were calmed by his presence. When we read the book of Acts, we see Peter standing up boldly. We see John proclaiming. We see they're, 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 they're standing there with, with perfect posture, completely unafraid, unfazed. They're beaten, and they're told, uh, never preach again. And they say, we can't listen to you. We respect you. We honor you as the authorities over this nation. But we will listen to God. And if you have to beat us, then beat us. And we will count it an honor to be beaten for Jesus Christ's sake. That's a different disciple. 
any way you look at it, hiding in the corner, afraid, Peter denying Jesus, and they go out bold, and they go out completely composed. What's the difference? The difference is his presence. They thought that when Christ died on the cross, they were saying goodbye to the presence of Jesus in their lives. But when he rose, and more specifically, when he ascended, he secured for all of us the particulars of his presence at all times in every place. Because through the spirit of Jesus, he is present in every gathering, in every home, every life of every single Jesus follower has the promise of the presence of God at all times. Why would they be calmed by his presence? Because his presence unlocks peace. Why? Because Jesus is the prince of peace. What that means then is he doesn't give peace. He is peace. Listen to me. Jesus doesn't give us peace. He is peace. And that's how he could speak to the situation, the words that he did of, I give you my peace. Notice in Ephesians 2.14, Paul tells us he himself is our peace. Now, we then have to reframe our understanding of what peace is, because we often think that peace is the absence of trouble. But peace is not the absence of trouble. Peace is the presence of God. If Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he is present in a situation, then even in trouble, you can have peace. So right now, in the midst of this virus, in the midst of economic uncertainty, in the midst of of perhaps unemployment and fears and worries, rightfully so in some cases. Some of those things are real, and they have to be worked through. But right there in the midst of your situation, Jesus offers his perfect peace because he is your peace. And so in growing close to Jesus, you are always moving closer to peace, calmed by his presence. And the result of this situation, of them encountering Jesus and realizing that he is alive, and he would not be taken from them by death, nor would he be taken from them by the ascension, then what they realize is we can then be calm. And I love that the book of Acts tells the story of young heroes rising up, fueled by the presence of God. And my prayer in this time is that God would raise up a generation of specifically young heroes. I'm speaking to you high school students and junior high students. I'm speaking to you young people, college students. I'm believing for an awakening. I'm believing for a quickening. We've, in these you know, last years, just heard so much about this generation and this gen- that what this generation is, what this gen- But I'm telling you, God is speaking a new word over this generation. It's time for a generation to rise up as, 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 as only uh, propelled by the Holy Spirit would make possible, and to speak peace to a world that's full of fear, and that God has allowed what has transpired in, in these days, uh, not caused it. I, I'm not, this, this coronavirus and, and all sickness and all death is caused by the brokenness of this world through it being given over to futility because of sin. So never was it God's plan. But God has always, from, from before eternity passed, uh, had the plan to overwhelm the goodness, uh, overwhelm the difficulty with his goodness. And that's what he's going to utilize to cause his peace to flood through this world, is, is his people gripped by his presence, consumed by his glory, who then can rise up, young heroes, unafraid, uh, to show his love. Secondly, they were calmed by his words. So his presence, just being there with them, changed their demeanor, changed their situation. And they were also calmed by his words. For as he opened his mouth, he spoke the words, I give you peace. My peace I give to you. Peace be with you, were the words out of his mouth. Uh, They were calmed by his words. The circumstances didn't change. They were still very, uh, very much in danger. And all, almost all of them, except for John, would go on to die uh, deaths. So their great fears actually came to pass. But they no longer had reason to fear it. So what they were facing didn't change. But the resources of his word in them was what changed them. He gave them the words peace. Now, we, we referenced it before, but now let me define it for you, because it's different than how we refer to peace. We, 
you know, would throw the peace sign is kind of like, hopefully things don't go bad for you. Or, you know, maybe, maybe a victory in trial. Or we would think of it just as the absence of challenging circumstances, right? Peace, right? Would peace make, make peace, not war, right? The absence of conflict would be how we would describe peace. But that's not the biblical sense. The, the word shalom, which is the idea Jesus is tapping into, was part of just deeply rooted in the Middle Eastern culture and this belief system that we find in the Old Testament, the Jewish faith. And the idea of of, of shalom spoke of a, a wholeness of well-being that came from God giving you every good gift. Really, someone said that's how you could best define shalom. May you receive, when he says, may, may God's peace be with you, him saying, may God give you every good gift. May God give you every good thing. May you be totally well spiritually and, and physically. May in every way you receive God's wellness. And we can have that wash over us. And that can allow us to, to know that he is not only with us, but he's for us and wants to give us every good thing. And if we don't have it, that means it's not a good thing. And if he hasn't given it to us, then that means that either we don't need it or he has a plan to give it to us down the road. And so we can trust him. We can be calmed by his words, calmed by his presence in our situation. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about, and, and rightly so, how when we get through this, we're going to celebrate. When, when, and I, I think there's a place for that. I think there's a place for you know, sort of framing this thing as something that, too, is going to pass. You know, it feels like it's ongoing. And, and, and quite frankly, the way they keep talking about, like, well, it was 15 days, and, and then, well, it could be over by, by July, and eight weeks of this, this regulation. And I think, to, to some extent, it's a little bit unhelpful just to fixate on when is this going to be over. I mean, it's, it's human to want to have a timetable. It's human to want to understand the dynamics at play. But at the same time, uh, I, I would say this. Yes, we should believe this is going to pass. And, and certainly, this is not going to be the end. Uh, but at the same time, uh, let's not wait till it's over to celebrate. Right. Meaning, meaning, let's not uh, give God the praise only when this is all over. I think that to be uh, a spiritual early adopter or to be a people of faith would be to take him at his word, that he has a plan, that he's going to work all things together for good. And this is not how it's all going to end. It's going to all end with Christ returning and setting up his kingdom. That's the end. So this is not the end. Uh, but as we, as we anchor our hearts with his words, what are we able to do? We're able to find shelter in the storm. Yes. Not shelter when we get to the end of the storm. Not, I'm going to believe God when he gets us all through this. But no, we're going to find, and I, I, I'm sorry to use this phrase because it's, it's all over the country right now, but we're going to find shelter in place. Shelter in place, in the place that we're in. Not shelter when we get through this, shelter on the other side of this. We're going to find shelter in place, in the middle of our storm. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst. So yes, he's there with us as we gather corporately in larger settings. And I can't wait when we get back. I, can't, I, I think we should celebrate. We're going to have the greatest party ever when this is all over, for sure. And that's true of, of life ending as well. There's going to be the greatest party when this life ends, when this trial ends, and we get to come back together. It will be so amazing. But where two or three are in an apartment, where three or four are in a house, where, where two or four are in a, in, a, in a dorm room, where you are, you even seemingly feel alone in your situation, I'm telling you, he is there in the midst. You can anchor your heart to his word and celebrate now and rejoice now that he has a plan now. He's up to something now. He's still seeking to give you every good gift now. And so his peace is with you. Total well-being right now. Shelter in place calmed by his words, calmed by his presence, and calmed by his wounds. Now, this is an interesting one. But the text actually says, if you look at verse 20, they saw his wounds. He showed them his hands and his feet. Then the disciples were glad. He showed them his wounds. Then the disciples were glad. That is to say, their gladness was already, of course, there seeing him. And already they're hearing from him. But then the text says, knowing that they were afraid, he went on to show them his hands, show them his wounds, and then their gladness boiled over. Uh, the Amplified translation talks about their, their joy being filled with exultant joy, being filled with exultant joy, meaning their, their joy just, just went to a different level when they saw his wounds. Why would his wounds comfort them? For one thing, it gave, gave them confidence that it really was him. 
of course. Uh, the, the, he was the, the, the person who they saw die on the cross. They were, they were, they were convinced. Because remember, Jesus was in, now this is some theology over our head, right? Anytime we get into this stuff, we're, we're, we're dealing with things that are too lofty for us to really understand. But we know that Jesus was in his resurrected body. Okay, now, when you die and go to heaven, when I die and go to heaven, we're not going to be in our resurrected bodies. Our bodies are going to stay here on this planet in a grave. And at the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age, those bodies will be resurrected. You're like, what are we going to live in in the meantime in heaven? I don't know. Maybe he's got a loner for you. Uh, maybe your spirit will be allowed to take on properties of, of, of a body. Uh, but the Bible does not tell us that. But what it does tell us is that Jesus himself came out of the grave in his resurrected body. So this is how he was able to uh, physically eat. Because in a minute, we're going to see him you know, eating food. Uh, and in fact, uh, in verse 39 of Luke 24, same story. It says, behold my hands and feet. It is I myself. It's not someone else. It's I myself. Same Jesus you saw die. This is I myself. Uh, see my wounds. Okay, same wounds that you saw on that cross. Then he says, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Okay? And then that same passage, he says, you still don't believe me. Give me something to eat. And he starts eating. He's like, can a ghost do this? Can a ghost do that? <laughs> right? I love this. He says, a spirit doesn't have bones, right? Ghosts don't have bones. Ghosts don't touch me. But ghost, when have you ever seen a ghost have, a, have, a, have bones? You're like, uh, Disney movie? Like the bones <laughs> dancing? Huh. Dem bones, you know what I'm saying? Right? But he says, ghosts don't have bones. Eat, if you give me some food. Watch me eat, right? Look at my wounds. Check them out if you need, me, need to. So, so what we what need to understand is that he was proving to them he was actually risen. And some of our great fears are death is the end. Some of our great fears are when we lose someone we love that I'm never going to see them again. And that we ourselves going into the grave, if this coronavirus does kill one of us or two of us or, or, or more than that of us, that there would be a great fear that, that life will be over. But he's saying, no, look at how I came through to the other side. And guess what? You're going to come through to the other side. Everybody you love in Christ is going to come through to the other side. And just as Jesus is still Jesus himself, you're still going to be Leon yourself. Yeah. I myself. And what, com what comfort that gives you? What peace that gives you dealing with death, having to face death? They were comforted and calmed by his wounds. But it's more than that, because the last time they saw those wounds, they represented the worst thing that had ever happened to these disciples. We cannot properly explain to you what Jesus meant to them. For there's nothing in our culture even close. Though being in an election year, being in a time when we're thinking about presidents and elected officials, and, and it's crazy to think even in the midst of all of this. And of course, many are trying to use this for their own advantage. Well, this wouldn't have happened if this, and this wouldn't have happened. You know? And the reality is, um, well, I'm not going to even talk about that. But I will say that the disciples had all of their hopes pinned on Jesus, not only as a spiritual leader, but also as a political messiah, also as the one who was going to save the nation and fulfill all the prophecies from the Old Testament about what the nation of Israel was meant to be. And they thought that they were going to be in his cabinet when he took office. So when he was killed, their whole dreams for the future were just shot down in a second. When Pilate washed his hands and he said, let him be crucified, everything they thought that life was going to be like just all of a sudden, in a moment, vanished. And those wounds were the center of it all. Those wounds in their hand were to them the worst thing imaginable. And now he brings those same wounds to them and says, check it out. Those, this is what you thought. Like, you thought life was over because of this. I'm telling you, God is through this moment calming them with the reality that we need to be gripped by. And that is whatever we take to be the worst thing imaginable, God has a plan to reconcile all things, even to himself. He has a plan to redeem it. He has a plan to restore it. And not even death can stop that from happening. The resurrection and the promise of eternal life tells us that Jesus will not only uh, make up for the difficult things that, that we've had to face by, by giving us a life forever. But he actually will restore dreams that died 
in our, in our, in our hearts before, uh, before we left this world to go home to heaven. He's saying, not even death can stop me from doing all that I've planned to do. And this that you took as evidence of God not having control over the universe is actually uh, how he was intending to accomplish it. This is how C.S. Lewis put it once when he said, heaven, when we finally fully experiencing it, experience it, it will work backwards. And it will take all the heart sickness and all the grief and all the despair we ever felt here and actually cause something glorious uh, to burst forth. And we'll, in eternity, see it and go, oh my god, you just made up for that. You just restored that. And I think one of my favorite examples of this happening in a microcosm is when Moses, after dying, got to come back at the transfiguration and step foot for the first time in his entire life inside the promised land. And, and we look at his whole life. It all pointed to getting to the promised land. He died because of his sin and didn't get to the promised land. And Jesus is like, just chill. I'm, I'm going to take you back with me, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure style. And Jesus did, in fact, bring Moses into the promised land. I'm sure he was looking around like, I died thinking this was never going to happen. And whatever you have in your heart that, that you feel like, it can't happen because of this. It can't happen because of the grave. It can't. Let me just tell you, God gets the last word, and you will watch heaven work backwards, just as he showed them the wounds and said, you thought your life was over. You thought your dreams was over. I was just getting started. Even after the grave, even after death, I am restoring all things Amen. to myself, calmed by his wounds. This also is amazing to me because he's reminding them, as he shows up showing his wounds to them, that Jesus' focus is always on what he has done for us and not on what we need to do for him. He didn't show up into this classroom and go, hey, uh, what's your memory verse for the week? Tell, me, tell it to me. He didn't show up in this room and go, hey. You keep any of the Ten Commandments lately? I'm looking at you, Peter, right? Liar, right? He didn't come into this room and say, what are the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount? In what order, right? He came into this room and goes, look what I did for you. Wow. He, he, he's saying that heaven and relationship with God and, and, and walking in, in the middle of the storm with peace is not about what you do for me. He's saying it's about what I have done for you. Yeah. Take confidence. Right. And what Jesus has done for them always comes before what he calls them to do for him. And then number four, we're getting close to the end here. They were calmed by his mission. So after they were anchored by presence and peace and anchored by his, his payment he made for them on the cross with these wounds and his side, his hands, his feet, he then gave them a mission. And they too, they, they, cal they were calmed by that too. The mission, of course, was, as the Father sent me, so I also send you. And the word send is uh, a diplomatic phrase. It's send, but not just send on an errand. It's sent with an official mission on behalf of the embassy. You see, they now were a part of a new kingdom. They now were approaching a brand new way to be human and filled with his peace, just like you are as a Jesus follower. You are on a, you are on a diplomatic mission. Your kingdom is heaven. And you now have sort of diplomatic immunity, uh, e even from some of the, the ways this world operates. And you get to live on a higher level. You get to live above the storm. You get to soar on wings as eagles. And in all that you do, you are sent. Uh, into your home. You are sent. Some of you who, who work for UPS or work for a hospital, work for a grocery store or a food delivery, you are sent into the situation that you are in. You are sent into this. You are not just going to this. You are not at the, at the whim of this crazy world. You are sent into the situation. Sent mom and dad into your home. Sent. I was thinking about how when we normally gather, we fill up rooms. For us as a church, we fill up rooms across Montana and across in Salt Lake City and in Portland and Jackson Hole. And families come in, and they check their kids into classrooms. And then they get greeted by a team. And they come into rooms like this and, and sit down with expectation to hear from God, with friends who they've brought who don't know God, with, with prayer requests and with offerings. And, and we come and we gather, believing that as we gather, there's peace. As we gather, we're going to be calmed. As we gather, we're going to be comforted. But what I saw this week as I was studying that blessed me so much was he said, 
As the Father sent me, I send you. So peace to you. He repeated himself. Do you see it in verse 21? So he said to them again, peace be to you. As the Father sent me, I sent you. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. Which, what does that mean, you're thinking? It means the same thing that Romans 10, 14 means. How can they know unless we go? How can they hear unless someone preaches? How can they believe unless someone points them to, to look to Jesus? If we don't preach, if we don't go, if we don't take the diplomatic mission, the, the official work on behalf of the embassy of heaven, how can anybody in the world ever know if we, his people, don't take the news to them? But what I like is he showed up as they gathered with peace. But as they were sent out on mission, he once again spoke peace. What does that mean? Yes, I love the gathering. I can't wait till we can one day gather again. And even in a greater sense, I can't wait until heaven when we'll all be gathered forever. But until then, let's not forget, there's not just peace for the gathering. There's also peace for the scattering. As we are sent, as we are in homes, as we're separated, even in quarantine, don't forget, Jesus didn't have to unlock the door to get into the room. With your door locked, with the quarantine firmly in place, there's shelter in the storm. There's peace as you believe you are on mission, doing what God has called you to do, being right where you are, right here, right now. They're calmed by the mission. And then lastly, and we'll end here, they were calmed by his spirit. For Jesus didn't just speak peace as he sent them. He breathed on them. And I realize he should have had a mask on too soon. But Jesus, the 11th who joined the 10 that were in this room, he breathed on them. And as he did, he said, receive the spirit. And the same spirit that is able to come upon all of us as we receive power to be sent, as we receive power to see our situations and circumstances differently, to see our sicknesses differently, to see our rapidly depleting reserve of pork and beans or whatever it is depleting. Okay, we're down to three rolls of toilet paper. It's deplete, right? Whatever you're, you're dealing with is you believe there's power upon you. It's the same power Jesus gave them in this room. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead has been given to his followers to do all that we've been called to do as we're sent out into this world to our homes and to our situations. Those who know such things well say that the same word that's translated from Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Hebrew word in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's the same exact word for breathed that's used of Jesus breathing on his disciples. And it's no mistake that the same word would be used, because Genesis 2, 7 says that in creation, God formed man of the dust of the earth and then breathed into his nostrils. And then man became a living being, alive because of God's breath. For just as that took place to see the first Adam, the New Testament tells us Jesus is the second Adam. He's the, the great Adam. He's Adam 2.0. He's Adam new and improved. Because where Adam failed in the garden, Jesus succeeded in the garden. Before going to the cross, he passed into the garden of Gethsemane. And there he fell on the ground, the same ground, the same dust out of which God brought Adam. And, and Adam the second here in this garden did not fail. Adam the second did not falter. And because of what he accomplished in the second garden, he was able to send out his spirit for all of us to not just be alive through, we're all alive at this moment, but to be alive in Christ and filled with power and able to do what we can't do on our own. The first Adam, his failure took place when he and his wife took forbidden fruit from a tree. But our second Adam, who even now is breathing on his people, breathing on these moments, breathing on his word as it goes out across the internet, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, his greatest victory came because of what happened on a tree. As John 19 says, here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side. And notice, Jesus is still in his rightful spot right there 
in the middle. It was because of what Jesus did in the middle of two criminals who deserved to die, as he died right there in the center, that our sins were paid for so we could be forgiven and be right with God. We're right with God because he hung in the middle, right in the middle. And no matter what you're feeling or what your emotional state is like today, I just want to just speak life over you, speak comfort over you in the name of Jesus, and ask you to pray with me. If this message is one you're receiving, could you just, you don't have to raise your hands necessarily, but just open your palms to the, to the heavens. Open your, open your palms up. It's an ancient way of, of saying, I, I'm open. I want to receive. I believe that right now, Jesus is in your room. Quarantine can't keep him out. Fear can't keep him out. Locked doors can't keep him out. Jesus is there wanting to breathe on you, wanting to fill you with power and peace. If you're receiving that with your palms open, just take a deep breath for me. Father, I pray for a fresh breath from heaven, a sense of comfort and calm because of your presence and your power and your peace and your wounds and your victory and your love for us. We need to see things that are the same things we saw last week, the same things we saw yesterday, but we need to see them with different vision. Help us to see this, God, not as a great cross to bear, but a great opportunity for us to be light and shine brightly the hope that is ours because of your son. Thank you, God, for what we've received in your presence today. Now I want to pray for those who are listening to this message and you've never trusted in Jesus for salvation. You're kind of still on that, I'm trying to do good things for God. I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be kind. And that's great, but it's about what he's done for you. Have you received what he paid for as he hung there with those wounds? Have you received his spirit into your heart as a, as a new believer? to be born again because of a Jesus. If that's, if that's not something that's happened for you, today's the day and now's the time. God loves you. He sees you. He's right there where you are, knocking on the door of your heart. And I believe for many, this is the moment to be born again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a prayer. And if you're ready to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you've never heard the gospel communicated clearly. You've never really had that realization. And today's your day for the first time to make that choice. Or perhaps there's some prodigal sons or daughters out there. And you knew this. You grew up knowing this. But you strayed. And, and right now, in this moment, when, when all the, the gods of this world are proven to be false idols, the god of money, the god of, of sex, the, the, the things that we would ordinarily live for, right? this, the benefit of this trial is it's really exposing what is powerful to build your life on and what's not, and how fragile trusting in anything but Jesus is. And so in this moment, as we're about to pray this prayer together, I, I just want to call on you to, to know that if you pray this prayer, no matter what's behind you, God will save you and come into your life and make you new. Say this with me. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I can't fix myself, but I believe you can. Please come into my heart and make me new. I give myself to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.